Right, so you know the place to be this uh, holiday season is definitely Kweu. And if you're home, definitely be rest assured that EIB Network will be bringing you all the pictures. But you've got to be there to see yourself on TV, hear yourself on the radio, and be part of that big fun. Still on the celebration, uh, the State of Affairs team took to the streets to find out if people are still excited about Easter as they were some years back. It's easy. Everything easy, but now we are grown, so we have to care for ourselves. <laughs> the the, the people will celebrate Easter most. That old time, if you, Easter time, I, I feel happy because something come my hometown, concerts, steam jams, and a lot. That time, then I feel happy. That time, I don't know a lot. Sometimes at that age, my mother stands at my back and they baptize me. But when I grown up at least 20, 25, 30, I stand to confirm that whatever that happens, I can be strong and talk to my God. You know, today is not like the olden days. Nowadays, things are tough and things, so people don't celebrate as it was. We do go to Easter convention and stuff, and we do enjoy in the house too. When I was young, my mom used to take us to our hometown. But now we don't. I, I wish to celebrate it here now that I'm old, I'm old enough to take care of myself. I go out with my mom and dad, with my, my siblings. We celebrate, we celebrate it and that makes me very happy. But now I'm alone with my husband, but we don't go out. The time that we were uh, at Roman Catholic Church and then we were children, we marched together with, the, with brass band and everything. And then uh, at the evening too, we go to cemetery uh, on light day. It seems uh, we say we are celebrating Easter, but however, that spiritual aspect is not there. We go, uh, we go to dances, we, uh, we, uh, we do so many things. That is what actually related to the death of Christ. Oh. EIB Network made up of GH1 TV, Live FM, Star FM, Kasapa FM, Ultimate FM, Ago FM and Empire FM are all in queue with this Easter with a mega Easter bash assured. Activities lined up include an Aquaba bash at Nkoko tonight and a street jam at Obomeng High Street tomorrow, that is Good Friday. There will also be an Ago Fitness Walk coupled with a High Life concert on Saturday at Nyakwaba Nyakun Hotel at Obo. On Sunday, there will be a Kasapa Kitchen inside Kwewu where there will be lots to eat. Artists on the bill include the music man himself, Kojo Entry, Iron Boy, Amachi Dede, the man with a silky voice, Anakwame, KK Fosu, and Atom. Um, it promises to be very exciting. I mean, if you're going to have uh, Kojo Entry on the bill, Amachi Dede on the bill as well, why would you sit in Accra or Kumasi or Takrade or anywhere at all? You've got to be in Kwewu this Easter and EIB, of course, making it as big as it can. Now we move on to other stories. Uh, lawyers of the New Patriotic Party have threatened to si threatened to cite the suspended uh, national chairman Paul Afoko for contempt if he does not desist from media comments on matters that relate to the case in court. Afoko's counsel, Safu Boabeng, admitted that his client had indeed been making comments on the media landscape. The presiding judge, Antony Yabua, after hearing from both sides, proceeded to adjourn the matter to April 12 for both parties to complete the filing of documents. The NEC, that's the National Executive Committee of the party, unanimously voted to suspend Paul Afoko indefinitely in October last year. The decision came after the National Council of Elders in September last year wrote a letter demanding that Paul Afoko be made to step aside until after the 2016 elections. And still on the NPP, the party has accused the Bureau of National Investigations of infringing on the rights of the three South African ex-police officers who were arrested in the central region for allegedly training security guards. An Accra Circuit Court ruled that each of them be granted bail to the tune of 20,000 cities with one surety. The judge ordered that the accused persons be held in the court registry pending the fulfillment of their bail conditions. The BNI, however, defied this order and subsequently sent the accused persons to their headquarters for holding this 
turn of events outraged the lawyers for the accused persons who had earlier demanded that their clients be held in the court registry and released pending the fulfillment of their bail conditions. The NPP member of parliament for Ibuakwa South, uh, Samuel Akachia, expressed the party's displeasure at the breach of protocol. Um, he stated that the NPP will bring the BNI to order using legal avenues. Now, almost 4,000 people die of tuberculosis every day. That's pretty staggering, isn't it? As the world marks World Tuberculosis Day today, the World Health Organization's focus is for all countries to unite to end the deadly uh, disease. Here's a news desk report. Each year, March 24 marks World Tuberculosis Day, an ancient disease that has claimed and continues to claim millions of lives worldwide. This year, the WHO is calling on countries and partners to unite to end TB. Ending TB by 2030 is a target of the Sustainable Development Goals and the goal of the WHO to end TB strategy. The WHO end TB strategy aims to reduce TB deaths by 90% and to cut new cases by 80% between 2015 and 2030 and to ensure that no TB-affected family faces catastrophic costs due to TB. TB ranks alongside HIV and AIDS, the world's top infectious disease killer. In 2014, 9.6 million people fell ill with TB and 1.5 million died from the disease, including 380,000 among people living with HIV. More than 95% of TB deaths occur in low and middle income countries, and TB is among the top five causes of death for women aged 15 to 44. A tuberculosis prevalence survey conducted in 2014 revealed that TB bedding in Ghana is three times higher than the World Health Organization estimates. Prior to the survey, WHO estimates showed that TB cases in Ghana were below 92 per every 100,000 people. But the survey across the country showed that there were 286 cases per every 100,000 people in the country. Tuberculosis is a communicable disease caused by a bacterium which mostly attacks the lungs and other organs of the body. The disease is transmitted from a sick patient to another through coughing, singing, and sneezing, and its major symptoms are coughs, which last for more than two weeks, loss of weight, tiredness, night sweats, chest pain, and cough with blood-stained sputum. All right, so we go on the phone now to talk to Dr. Na Shile Van der Poy. She's in charge of the International Healthcare Center. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening, Dr. Van der Poy. I mean, we just saw a, new desk, a news desk report about uh, the state of tuberculosis here in Ghana. As the world marks uh, World Tuberculosis Day today, what was the focus? What was the message to Ghanaians? Well, good evening. Yes, today was uh, World TB Day, and um, the message we actually had to Ghana and to the entire world was that we um, we all have to unite to ensure that we end TB by 2030 of the coming year. Okay, and by 2030, we are told that the 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 the, the, the estimation is that we'll cut deaths by 90 percent and infections by about 40 percent. With the way education has been going over the years, and also uh, considering the rate of infections uh, recorded on a daily basis. Are we able to meet this figure by 2013, this estimation by 2030? I think if you know, um, globally we um, put more effort into fighting tuberculosis, we should be able to do that. What we actually need is we need more resources. We need more resources to be able to um, get more sophisticated equipment to diagnose TB. What we actually have right now is a very old way of diagnosing TB, which is using the sputum microscopy. But as you know, many diseases continue to come and we have things like co-infection. We are beginning to see that we are missing some of the TB cases. And it's just because of the fact that we continue to work with very, very old ways of diagnosing and, and, and the condition. So one of the major um, um, efforts will be for us to advocate for more resources to enable us to get more equipment that will enhance the work we are already doing in trying to identify 
cases actively, so not just sitting and waiting for people to come to us when they are already infected, but we actually going out into the community and actually looking actively for possible TB cases. Okay, now you mentioned the ill resources we have at present. Is this something you have tabled? I mean, you, you mentioned that you've been advocating, but are your voices going far enough? Because if we are trying to meet a certain estimate, a certain cut in deaths and infections by a certain time, and then we are also bedeviled by the lack of resources, I mean, it, it's difficult to picture how it will work. Is this something that you have tabled, and how far have you gone with it to ensure that you get these resources to fight the disease? Yeah. Yeah, well, globally, um, estimates have been made, and that is how come you know they know for a fact that if indeed we say we want to end TB by 2030, then we really have to step up in, in you know, mobilizing resources. In Ghana, I can't really say that you know we are that far. We even are still struggling, um, trying to even use the little we have here to you know continue with the work that we are doing. So we are not really on that level where we say we can do what the, you know globally what is being done. But definitely we also want to end TB by 2030 in Ghana because otherwise the world will not be able to, um, to end it. So yes, indeed, we are also on our own scale still advocating for, um, for more advanced technologies. And actually right now Ghana has made a step. And um, through the National Tuberculosis Program, we are actually getting some equipment which are more sophisticated to add on to um, the ordinary tissue microscopy that you know we usually use in most of the health facilities. So we definitely are making headway. But um, even with this equipment that are coming into the country, it's not enough to cover the entire country. It's not enough for all the um, districts in Ghana. So we are starting with 90 districts out of the 200 and something. So you see there already we have a gap. And so that is what we still continue you know, to advocate for, that yes, indeed, steps are being made, but it's not enough. And we need to be you know, more proactive in ensuring that we, uh, we, we get more of such equipment to help us in our work. Okay. Now, I, I, I'm afraid I have to take you back to a point you made earlier um, about people coming in at the latter part or the latter stage of the infection. So what it means is that it is not reported early enough. Do people appreciate the signs of tuberculosis? And I know uh, your organization, the International Health Care Center, also deals with HIV and AIDS. Is there a problem with uh, stigmatization as far as tuberculosis is also concerned? Yes, there definitely is um, an issue of stigma when it comes to tuberculosis as well. And I think it's because of the fact that people don't really understand what tuberculosis is. Unlike HIV, tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria, which is um, something that can be cured. We have actually medications that if you go in early and you, know, you are uh, diagnosed early enough and are put on this treatment for six months, you actually are cured. It means that you stop taking the medicines after this time and you don't have tuberculosis anymore. It's just because of the fact that people who get it and don't go in early actually could even have signs of having AIDS because you lose weight drastically that if you're not very careful, people might think you have an HIV or AIDS. That's where the stigma comes in, when people are not very sure as to what exactly the problem could be. And because of that, people still continue to hide and they don't want to come out and as such, will end up going to a health facility when they really are in a very critical stage. And at that stage, if you're not also very careful, these very strong medicines that we are using, the body might not even be able to contain them. And then the outcome doesn't really, you know, be the best. Either you die or you even will develop multiple drug resistant tuberculosis, which is also another issue on its own. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ni Adna Ashile Van der Poy. Uh, she's in charge of the International Healthcare Center, and she was speaking to us in relation to uh, World Tuberculosis Day, which was today. We are taking a short break. When we come back, we'll be discussing the latest Afrobarometer uh, report. And also, if you're going to Kwewu, I am interested. Let us know. Um, sorry, I will read out your messages, and the hashtag is State of Affairs. We'll be right back.
welcome back. And as I told you earlier, we are discussing the latest Afrobarometer report. And if you haven't seen it, well, in there, about 82% of Ghanaians or respondents of this re research uh, believe that Ghana is headed in the wrong direction. To help me discuss this issue tonight uh, is Charles Daniel Kwejopoku. He's a lecturer at the Methodist University uh, College. You're actually an economics lecturer. Yes. And also Dr. Ahmed Jinafo, lecturer from the University of Education, Willow. It's good to see you, Dr. Jinafo. I missed you last week. Yes, I know. Yeah, you abandoned us. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay, now before we go into that discussion, let's take a look at our quick facts about the latest report. Welcome back to the show. Dr. Jinapa, what are your initial thoughts on that report? Well, I think, uh, let me say good morning, uh, good evening to your cherished uh, viewers. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's intriguing, intriguing in the sense that uh, if you look at the, the data being provided, we are looking at about 82% of Ghanaians uh, asking that uh, or indicating that the country is moving in the, right, uh, in the wrong direction. But I think another point that needs to be made is this is an empirical study. And empirical studies normally are done within a certain framework. Framework in the sense that, uh, first of all, uh, what was the objective and intent of this study? What did this study intend to achieve? I mean, what is the, what is the purpose? Mm. Uh, is it just to find out how Ghanaians feel about uh, what <coughs> is going on and just leave it at that? Uh, what are the more or less recommendations that have been put in terms of uh, addressing some of the issues that have been that have been uh, channeled out. That said, Nana, as I said, uh, it's an empirical study, and when it comes to studies of this nature, uh, normally there are three things that we are looking out for. I mean, of course, I'm not in any way going to sit here and doubt uh, the capability of uh, this uh, institution because if you look at their profile, it's quite an impressive profile and mm -hmm. one that is well versed in most of these things. But I think the information being put out there is a little bit scanty for some of us because. Uh, how did they try as much as possible to bring out some level of objectivity? You know, uh, of course, you are looking at a population sample of about 1,000 to 2,400. How was the sampling done? You know, if you are doing a sampling uh, of a political issue of this nature and you happen to do it in an environment where, quote and unquote, it seals one political party, definitely you are going to get some kind of results. And that's, uh, I mean, I'm, I do not in any way 
tend to doubt mm. the results being put out there. But I mean, these are questions that need to be asked. What was the instrument used? Was it a questionnaire? Was it through interviews? You know, I mean, how did they even validate the instrument? I mean, how reliable is it? So I think I read somewhere that uh, this organization or institution happens to work for, is it uh, Transparency International or something of that sort? And I think somewhere last year, is it early this year, there was also a report by another international organization that said corruption under the NDC had reduced to a certain level. That was Transparency International. Transparency. So uh, if, if there's a relationship between these two organizations, I mean, uh, what was the source of referencing? Because definitely, if you are doing a study of this nature, you need to be able to just oppose your finance with what was, what was uh, more or less brought out, what, what led to the change within this short period. Because if a mother organization is saying this is what it is, and you are saying this is where it is, especially when there's such huge difference, I mean, how do you more or less merge the two? So uh, I think uh, it's informing that uh, a study of this sort is being done, especially at a time that uh, Corruption is definitely going to be an issue of discussion, and you agree with me that it's been an issue of discussion between the main opposition, uh, the two main political parties, the NPP and NDC. If you remember the issue of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, how much projects cost. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all boiled down to what corruption. The issue mm -hmm. of even, I mean, how much is our national debt? <laughs> it boils down to corruption. So I think it's a contemporary issue. It is worthy of discussion. But uh, for some of us who happen to work within the spectrum of what they do, which is research, I mean, these questions definitely need to be okay. asked, and I think they are legitimate questions. All right. How about you, Charles? Uh, thank you, madam. I, I think that my friend said it all. It's an empirical study. Uh, nobody will doubt the institution, especially that you don't have the facts. Mm. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at 82%, Wanting, uh, say saying the that the, the one country direction. is moving the wrong direction. One that direction. is huge. That is very huge. So um, it is about <coughs> the feelings of people, and therefore depend on the angle. Even at times, depending on how you, you put the question, put the question, your answer can change. So if we get the details, probably we can do a better. Uh, analysis of it. But whatever it is, at least it is a signal. It is telling us something. Many people are talking about so many issues in Ghana, corruption probably on top. This is not the first time. Mm -hmm. and people have been talking about it. At times they link it to certain institutions, to certain organizations, to certain offices. And therefore this is not something that is new. Except that some of the percentages to me are too huge. And therefore, probably we need to know how the sampling was done. Um, if, for example, you go to, at times, some of these things we need to put in perspective. If you go to a place like the Volta region, mm -hmm. and you go and you ask that question, mm -hmm. especially if the people actually understand the implications of the answers they will give, I'm not sure you are going to get anything nearer that. But if you went to a place like the Ashanti region, of course, you should expect that you get these numbers. So if we know how the sampling was done, probably it will inform us. But, but if, if people, I mean, would, uh, let me put the question properly. If they went to the Volta region and people in the Volta region feel that their country is headed in the wrong direction, would they give a different answer? Uh, you know, what is happening in this country, let, let us be factual, let us be truthful to ourselves. There are people who believe that they belong to a, a party, a particular political party. And for that matter, no matter what happens, there is no way they are going to say anything bad right. about that particular party. That is a fact. There is nothing anybody can do about this. That is what is happening. So I just gave those typical examples so that we'll be able to put it in perspective. But if you go to a region where it is a swing region, and you carry Possibly out that the is research, where this research. But like Dr. Ajita said, we need more get, answers. Yes, you can yeah. get a very uh, good representative of the views of Ghanaians. Mm. And then probably we okay. can look at And this. apparently this research was done uh, for a period of a year, 2014 to 2015. And they interviewed between 1,200 and 2,400 2, persons. So to that figure of respondents, it doesn't quite reflect it's, it's less but, than 10%. But, but, but even that, I mean, 
1,200 to 2,400. That can be, I mean, you, you, there cannot be anything wrong with it, even though it's quite a small, small sample. sample when you look at the, the, the number of uh, Ghani, I mean, the total number of about 2.7 million. Of course, we've done studies where you take about five teachers, and based on your findings, you say that, look, it can be representative of the feeling of what most teachers. There's nothing wrong with it. But you see, I think my brother made an important point, mm. which is even beyond the, 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 the sampling, the question needs to be asked, what are the caliber of people who were what? Definitely. Part of this interview. I mean, what does moving in the wrong direction mean? If you say the country is moving in the wrong direction, mm. what does it mean? Do the participants or uh, do, they, do they understand what it means? You know, if you quite remember, Nana, at a point in time, Rollins said that for him, the economy is his stomach. <laughs> he said his, the economy is his stomach. And Kufo once upon said that, look, I mean, uh, 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 if we talk of economy, it's what? Your pocket. Your pocket. You understand? So if I'm full and I have money in my pocket, that is how I interpret and understand the direction in which the country is moving. So if somebody says that, look, the country is moving in the wrong direction, and 82% of the populace who happen to have been, uh, I mean, the, the population for, 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 this, uh, for, for this study, say that, look, the country is moving in the wrong direction, what does it mean? Do they understand what the direction or what, what, where the direction should be moving towards? But I think at the end of the day, like it or hate it, uh, whether uh, the sampling was well done, whether uh, uh, the questions were well presented or not, at least, I mean, it gives us an opportunity to gouge at what people, that's why they say it's a perception. Mm -hmm. It's not a reality, it's a perception. And if some people are saying that 82% of the country is moving in the wrong direction, and if I was in the opposition, I should say, hooray. <laughs> if I say 2% say that the country is moving in the wrong direction, then I think it's the best. But look at even the study that was done in itself. What are they saying? About, I think it's about 20% think that the opposition or something or that sort can solve what? Yeah. The problem. And they say opposition parties or party. They are not specific. Yeah. Either opposition party or what? Or party. So yeah. there looks, it looks as if there's a disconnection between where the direction is moving and who their savior is. And that is where I indicated that look, Notwithstanding all this, we should have we, the, 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 the study should have also given us the opportunity to know look, what are the recommendations? What are the suggestions coming from these participants who happen to have what partake in this study? Because after all, they are Ghanaians just like me. You know, what are they saying in terms of trying to deal with what the issue of what corruption? And I think when it comes to corruption, they did indicate, I think about 60 something percent, mm -hmm. indicated that corruption had increased 58. 58. Mm -hmm. And now that is where I asked. That look, this study, as you said, was done between 2014 to 2015. Mm -hmm. And within that same period, there was another study, which, interestingly, uh, the group that did the study happens to have a relationship with this uh, particular uh, organization. Mm -hmm. They indicated that, look, Ghana has done quite well in terms of what? The fight against corruption. Why is there that disconnection? I think it's a question that begs for answer. Okay. Now, if you go further in that report, um, there's also a, a part where it says that a, about 18% of the respondents chose from a range of issues, including unemployment, poverty, access to water and electricity. And they said that prudent economic management was Ghana's greatest challenge. Yeah, and, and, and that is where I, I think, uh, I mean, naturally, every Ghanaian, including me, want access to water. I mean, I don't have water in my area. And if you ask me my priorities, my priorities, one, I need water, I need accessible road. Mm -hmm. You know, my priorities may be different from you, depending on where you are, you live. But the irony is, if you look at, I mean, uh, 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 what has been said by the governing party, I mean, one of their, their, their trump cards has been provision of water. Mm -hmm. You agree with me? One of yeah. their trump cards has been what? Provision of water, accessible uh, 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 road network, and electricity. That has been their biggest achievements as being professed by what? By them. So what is the situation as it stands? As somebody from outside, I mean, somebody who happens not to be a respondent to this, uh, uh, to this uh, survey and not a member of what? Of the ruling government. I mean, can I say for a fact that there have been some appreciable improvement when it comes to water supply? Yes, there has been a number of projects. So how come we have this challenge? The issue of unemployment definitely is mm -hmm. not something that this survey needs to tell me. I mean, I know I live in Ghana and I know the situation when it comes to what? 
unemployment. I mean, there are so many factors that for me contributes to that, which of course were not being discussed uh, uh, in this survey. But I think uh, if you look at the issues that were being raised, issue of corruption, issue of access to water, issue of electricity, issue of what? Management of the economy. I mean, these are issues that definitely every Ghanaian, even if I, for instance, am being interviewed, I will happen to speak to. But in terms of the figures that are being given to you, and, oh, I mean, we are looking at about 1,200 to what? To 2,400. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's possible that, I mean, if the sampling was not well done, if the sampling was not that representative, you know, you definitely could get what these results. But uh, I think it's a, it's a call uh, in the right direction for government or people who are put in responsibility to try as much as possible to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Even though government is putting a lot of effort in the supply of water, people like me still think that a lot more needs to be done because mm -hmm. it hasn't got into what my tap. Okay, and then the electricity, I mean, it, when they say that they're still experiencing power challenges, it was, th that period was a painful period, 2014. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, it was the worst. It was so the I'm worst not, I'm, Yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. And so for me, what shocks me mm. is the 18% of the people who are saying that probably mismanagement, if you want to put it that way, or management of the economy is the most important thing. To be done. Is, it, is it too it's low? low? It's, too it's too low. low. It's, too okay. low. it's too low because when you are looking at a country, whatever it is, it is the management of the resources available that matters. You can have all that, but if you are, cannot manage it, then I don't know where you'll be heading towards. And therefore, I was expecting that we have a higher percentage for that particular one. And that is why I have a difficulty. In can you putting attribute the it to together. anything? That low figure? Uh, it, it that is why, you know, when you are asking questions, in this case, I'm sure because it was perception, probably there will be lead questions. Mm. They will be looking at certain particular variables. So if you come into my area and you are talking about, say, supply of water, for example, and I'm lucky, I've been supplied with water, mm. then for me, <laughs> there is nothing like mismanagement. Government is doing it right. So you are likely to have a lower percentage for such an issue. So it depends on the type of variables you are looking at. But generally, if you want to look at the antidote to economic uh, progress or otherwise, it should be management of the economy. Because everything about the resource, whether you are talking of human beings, you are talking of factors of production, mm -hmm. it is about management. So if you are not able to manage what you have, I don't know what you will be able to do. You are also and, surprised and that is why, by that, that figure. I think there's also a disconnection. Because when you say, uh, the country is moving in the wrong direction, 82%. Mm. And when it comes to prioritizing what needs to be done, and 18% sees management as a priority, then there's a problem. But even beyond that, Nana, did you say that this interview, the mode of uh, data collection was through interview? Did you say they did Th interview? That, that, that is what uh, if, uh, the if, report said. Yeah, because I asked this question, because if they did interview, then how did they get such a quantitative figure? You know, I mean, interviews, you are talking of what? A, a qualitative study where you are supposed to give yeah. out the... It says that thousand to, between 1,200 and 2,400 respondents were interviewed, interviewed in the language of the respondent's sure, choice. Sure, sure, sure. So, so how did they get the percentage? Is it that they were asked yes and no questions where 82% said, look, the country was moving in the wrong direction? <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? So I think there are a lot of questions that need to be raised. And that is where... I believe that, you see, most times, and I'm not trying to indict this institution, it's a credible institution, you look at the profile, they've done a lot mm -hmm. of study. I think when you bring out these figures or this information which is useful for a socioeconomic development and especially informs our decisions when it comes to elections, it is always important for you to try as much as possible to put out a lot of information mm -hmm. surrounding how the study was done so that people do not read political bias into it, you know, and that is where I started by indicating that what was the objective of this study? I mean, 82% think that the country is moving in the right, wrong direction, and so what? You, you understand what I'm saying? And so what? So what needs to be done? What is the significance? So recommendations. Recommendations. Okay. What is the significance of this study? But I think at the end of the day, and one thing that strikes me and which is very, very important and critical to this study is the issue of corruption. The issue of corruption. We'll discuss that yes. in detail pretty soon. But further to that is that 49% uh, said that the current government is badly managing the economy. Uh, 
So you see, doc, you see the problem. 18% said the most important thing is management. Now, 49% are saying the government is mismanaging the economy. Is there not a disconnect? Yeah, yeah. There, there, there it, is, it doesn't give you the total picture. And that's why some of us... So what were you uh, expecting? I was expecting that the two should move in the, almost the same direction. Because if there is mismanagement, if I perceive... If I perceive... equal figures, equal percentages. Almost, almost. If I perceive that there is mismanagement and about 49% of the total population, whether 1,002 or the, the highest, 2,004, are saying that it's almost 50%. And therefore, I expect that if we are talking of what will really solve the problem, since 49% thinks that it is a mismanagement, then management of the resources should come to that. paramount. Yeah, especially yeah. when they are saying that it's but moving in the wrong direction. It's just the opposite. Yeah. And therefore, the two figures should not be too different. Okay, now then we, we come back to the issue of corruption because every time you bring up uh, a corruption discussion, uh, people s s seek to question the will of uh, uh, the political system. And from this report, um, a, a good number do not believe that uh, political systems can fight corruption, can help us get over uh, that canker. Well, so which systems can? Because this is the system that we have. And, it, it, and it, doesn't it suggest that people have lost hope in, in wherever we have to go to seek uh, redress or to seek uh, some attention for the fight for, against corruption? Well, you see, at the, at, now, what was the percentage of people who thought that corruption was a problem? The, About, um, uh, let me get it yeah. properly. 64%. 64%. So, so that's quite on the high, but that is not, uh, that is not abnormal, especially when you uh, 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 look at the happenings that have taken place within the period of 2014 to 2015. You remember that was the time that we had the Hamas issue. Mm -hmm. That was the time that we had the National Service issue. Yes. <laughs> you know, there have been so many things that happened and you so agree the with me. So well. the atmosphere. The atmosphere. And you agree with me that even most of these issues came to finality or conclusion I mean, somewhere post-2015. Mm. The judges, for instance, it was just recently that most of the auxiliary workers were what? Were fired. And even as we speak, most of the judges are still in court. You know, the National Service personnel, uh, the case was in court. It mm -hmm. was not too long ago. So I think the atmosphere, uh, more or less, is a reflection of the results that is being, what, that is being provided. But I, 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 one way or the other, agree with more or less the despondency on the part of Ghanaians when it comes to the fight against corruption. Mm. But I disagree when the argument is being made that, look, uh, the political system or the democratic dispensation in which we are under cannot be a solution to what? To fight against corruption. I disagree with them. Because we've tried military dictatorship a number of years, and you know the results, you know? And if you are looking at what we operate now, where we have the rule of law, at least we have uh, freedom of expression, then I don't see why we cannot use this system to fight corruption. And for, for, for any reason, I mean, that is the only option that we have. Mm. We cannot go to any other option. But you see, the point is this, Nana. I strongly believe that when it comes to corruption in this country, there's no way that we'll be able to purge ourselves of corruption within two, three, four, or even ten years. But we've been it has fighting to be for a while. Yes. And we've, we've made been, very little we, progress. We've been fighting for a while, and we've made little progress because consciously we are not, as a people, ready to purge ourselves of corruption. That is a fact. Mm. People do all kinds of things, lock people up, but within ourselves, within ourselves, we appreciate and celebrate corruption. It is part and parcel of us. And I'll give you a typical example. Look, in Ghana, Nana, if you happen to be, let's say, a minister, and within a year or two, your lifestyle do not change. It do not change to the extent that you don't drive a V8, you don't build a house, you don't do this. They will say that you're a useless person. It's a case. That's the case. Today, these judges that we are talking of, if you go to their families and their close associates and relations, they will tell you that they are just victims of circumstance. Because they know that this is the system that we practice and there's nothing wrong with it. So the argument that I'm trying to make is that if we do not start by saying that, look, corruption is something that we want to do away with, inwardly and believingly, there's no way that we can do it. It's like repentance. Like do away with what? Your wrong deeds and what? And seeing Christ or whatever it is. 
So I believe that, look, yes, we've done a number of things, but why is it that it's still getting ingrained and ingrained and ingrained every time? Because at the end of the day, what we do are just addressing, I mean, one issue or the other at a particular point in time. But deep down in ourselves, we do not believe in what we are doing. Because if at the end of the day, you are a, a, a teacher, you are a police officer, and you do not see anything wrong with taking bribes, then how can you seriously, honestly fight corruption? I don't think it's something that can be done. So I believe that, look, it has to start from the top. It has to start from the top. Leadership by example. If you are a leader in your own small corner, let your subordinates know that you are against and you are not corrupt. Immediately you start doing that. People will follow. And of course, I mean, the necessary... Uh, 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 but sometimes the subordinates are quicker and smarter than the leaders. Yes. But, the the but, leaders probably but, don't even know what goes no, no, on. But the point is that that is, why, that is why we call it leadership. Mm. If you are put in a position, you have something we call responsibility, and we have what? Accountability. If for some reason you are being acquitted by what? By your subordinates, then it means that, first of all, you are not even qualified to be there. You know? Of course. I mean, why would you be put there? Because you are deemed to be one who is capable of what? Of solving the problem. Mm. But unfortunately, if you, the leader, you, what you preach, you happen not to do it, then I think that the, your subordinates will do worse. And I must say, look, when it comes to corruption, it's not limited to just politicians. It's something that even what? Uh, it, it's more ingrained in the public and the civil service, and mm -hmm. even within our own local communities than even at the, what? At the top. But... At the end of the day, those in leadership are given the responsibility to try as much as possible to address the issue. So there's no excuse if you say that, look, I'm in this position, and because my subordinates are able to outwit me, then I should be given the benefit of doubt. Right. I don't think uh, you should be pardoned. Okay, Charles, I mean, corruption, such a big issue. <clears throat> it is a big issue. <laughs> but the problem is that it appears that we have not defined it correctly within us. What is corruption? Stealing. What? what yeah. What, people will look at stealing. What is stealing? I am a worker. Let's say a secretary to a boss. Uh, I am not paid well. Mm -hmm. That is what I think. And so I find ways and means of getting certain jobs at home. I come to the office. I use the office time period to do that work. I go and get my money. What is that? Mm -hmm. That is corruption. If you are the boss, you are supposed to come to work at, say, 8. You come at 10. You expect your secretary to be there by 8. But you come at 10. If the secretary realizes that every time my boss comes at 10, therefore, instead of coming at 8, if she has something doing, she will do it right. and come at 9. One hour is gone. So if you continue to do that, what does that? That is corruption. So we should not be looking at the, only the bigger picture, the macro issue. We should be looking at the micro, the small, small things. So it appears that, like my brother said, we support corruption in a way. Probably we might not say it, but our behavior, if you are in a family. So you're suggesting, both of you are suggesting that it's probably... We need to change the way we do things ourselves. Part of our culture. Yes. Sure. We, we need to change it. it. We need to. Because when somebody is at a position of trust, I bet you, all who know you, will be asking you, you see, your nephew, your uncle's son, your sister's brother, whatever. They need to get work, find work for them. In most cases, if you don't do it, probably they don't even qualify in the first place. But you don't find ways and means of tilting the law mm -hmm. to favor your group. That is what your people will be telling you, that you are in a higher position. You never helped the family. Meanwhile, if it is about job, probably they will ask you for a certificate. And unfortunately, you never attended school. You don't have even the certificate. So how do I put you there? But they expect that you do it. If you don't do it, you have a problem. So now it is between you standing for the truth and getting uh, the spies at home or the reverse. So what do you do? If you are not careful, by the time you realize, you have compromised the position. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you become corrupt. So if we can look at all these things and internally we decide that as a nation, we should make the rules. We should let the rules work. It doesn't matter who goes contrary to the rule, whether you are the president, whether you are the chief servant down there, the rule should work as it should. If we can say it to ourselves and we believe in it, we should be able to go over corruption.
Mama, even I, though it will take some time. Mama, yes. I agree with Charles that look, there are the micro, which is the the petty things. Like, mm. I happen to be at lecture. I do not um, happen to be sitting on TV to be paid. It's corruption. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, yes, they matter. But we are talking of big issues, bigger issues. This glass, it costs one city. You would have bought it for one city. But because government is the one buying it, government buys it for 10 cities. And what happens? The person who is selling gets one CD. The person who sold it to you, even though he knows it's one CD, but gets another one CD. So it makes two CDs. Mm -hmm. And you take eight CDs. That is the situation that we are talking about. And that is where I want government or leadership to start by what? Leadership by what? Example. I mean, I live with you, I know you. We were both teachers. All of a sudden, you're a member of parliament. You're a minister. You're putting up buildings, buying land cruises. So we don't scrutinize I mean, that is it. overnight cash. No, we, we, we are not committed. Mm. If you quite remember, Obama came here and said, look, Africa needs, do not need strong men, but they need what? Strong, strong institutions. institutions. But the question that begs for answer is that institutions are manned by human beings. Institutions, the police, the BNI, Shrag, Yoko, they are manned by human beings. So if the human being there is not committed, is not dedicated, and subconsciously is not avowed to the whole ideological principle that, look, corruption needs to be purged. You are going nowhere. So I, I, I believe, and look, Nana, you remember this Supreme Court issue? The Supreme Court issue. Can you imagine if we have this recurrence of what happened at the Supreme Court in all sectors of what? Our institutions. What would have happened? That would have been an excellent start. You get what I'm saying? Every time you have the Public Accounts Committee sitting, you see what comes out. Mm -hmm. What happens? Nothing. If we can just make it a point that, look, this year, 2016, January to December, we are not going to fight any kind of corruption. We are just going to deal with our public accounts. Issues that comes up there, let's address it. I think it will be a good start. Okay. So I strongly believe that, look, you need to have dedication dedication on the part of the people who have invested with their responsibility. And as my brother said, look, if you are a boss and you happen to go to work at 10, your secretary definitely will come at what, 9.45. So if you are a minister and the guy working under you, the chief director, knows that you are corrupt, and as you rightly said, your secretaries will outwit you, and he, mind you, has the know-how, the skill, and the tactics when it comes to what, the manipulation of the system. He's going to uh, he's going to outwit you. Okay, let's take a break now. When we come back, we'll talk about, of course, more about corruption. And it's always such a big issue in every election year. Yet we make very, very little advancements in the fight. We be back shortly, and then I'll read all the messages you've been sending so far on social media. Do stay with us. This is uh, former President J.J. Rawlings, and you're watching State of Affairs on GH1. Welcome back to the show. So, um, I mean, I just want to talk about corruption being such an issue. Every election year, we talk about corruption. And between the two political parties is this versus that. You did worse. We did this, but we tried to do this about it. You did nothing about it. You pushed it under the carpet. We are exposing, and we are going to have the same tune played this year. Yet, after in each, any of these parties have assumes power, uh, the, the, the reports come out, either they're not doing very well or they've advanced just marginally or uh, just a little bit, you know. It just goes to say that we haven't done too much in the fight against corruption. Why? Do we just enjoy talking about <coughs> it in an election year? Is it what gets everybody talking? But we know very well within ourselves that we're not going to go anywhere with it. Uh, no, no. You see, <coughs> the issue of corruption and our political terrain it's as uh, old as Adam, isn't it? It's Corruption. so sad. It's so sad. You see, at times, I do not want politicians to begin to say that, but even when you were there, you also did a But that's what B. we get, equalization. I don't want, that is not the way out. Why was that person or party booted out? That party was booted out because maybe majority of Ghanaians felt that they were not doing what they were supposed to do, and therefore they were booted out. 
And the expectation is that you will perform better than they have done. And therefore, if you are having difficulty, you should not be using that as a yastic. So for me, the political parties probably have not got the guts to fight corruption. Let they haven't? Me give you, yes, that's what I see. Let me give you a typical example. Okay. Recently, but I started probably last year, mm. and by this year they were talking about this bus branding. <laughs> Government on her own decided that they should do some small investigation. So they, they did it. And something that cost us 3.6 million, they realized that actually it should have cost us 1.7 million. Mm. So they should refund 1.9 million. Uh, and then it came down to 1.5. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, let me tell you something. The, my problem with the, that is this. If you have realized that somebody did not do it right, and that is why we lost about 1.9 million, whichever way, mm -hmm. coming back to 1.5 or why is not my point. What did you do to those who were involved? Who made sure that if there had not been a public outcry or something, 1.9 million would have gone to waste? What did you do to them? Since nothing was done to them, then for me, you are only encouraging people to do it. As long as they don't get caught, nothing happens. If they get caught, what we do is just to ask them to bring back their money. And pay in installments. And pay it installment. So if I can find ways and means of taking that money, even though I know that if I'm caught, I'll be asked to pay, mm -hmm. I will get it, use it profitably in a productive venture. By the time I'm even caught and asked to repay that amount in bits and pieces, it will not be a difficult thing to do. I would have enriched myself. My family will be forever grateful to what I did. That is a situation. My expectation is that if somebody is caught in that web, that person should pay the money up front. If the person has not got it, the person has property, we should sell it and use it to defray the debt. It is only after we cannot get anything from that person. So that's the that kind person. of commitment That is the kind of for. committing I want to see governments put across, not this facelift type of thing. If you, you do you, that, you, you think you it's a not. facelift? That is how I see it. Uh, uh, okay, that's how I see it. That's how I see well, it. I think, uh, first of all, on the issue of the bus brand, the investigation did not emanate from government. It was the minority leader who raised an issue on the floor of parliament, it was HMS Sabons. Well, but there's a report from the AG on it. Yeah, yeah that, and we, that, we don't that, know that the was details. What, that was what necessitated, necessitated the it, chief yeah. of staff yeah. to yeah. cause an investigation, and mm -hmm. that needs to be uh, uh, corrected. Uh, that said, I think the question that you first put to my brother Charles was uh, whether political parties do have the commitment in the fight against corruption. And you agree with it alone. This country uh, has moved along for a, quite some time, especially in the fourth Republican dispensation. Uh, if you remember, I mean, uh, prior to 1992, we had a military dictatorship, even though some of us were little kids. But we, we are being told that as at that time, there was nothing like uh, accountability, even though the, the trump card of then government was probability and what? Mm -hmm. Accountability. How were you going to be what? Accountable to the citizenry when in the first place they do not have what? A stake in you being at the helm of what? Affairs because it was a military dictatorship. 1992 we then came in with what? The 1992 constitution. And the 1992 constitution in itself was supposed to be more or less a tool in the fight against corruption because all the tenants of fighting corruption what needs to be done are enshrined in the 1992 constitution. So if you look at what happened in 2000, and 2000, if you remember, she was sitting on the tour, Papa. Mm -hmm. It was more or less, uh, it, it engulfed around the issue of what corruption, because the NDC, PNDC was deemed to, uh, to be corrupt. In 2008, the same thing, it boiled down on what? On corruption. So the argument or the question that begs for answer is that, why is it that this thing keeps what? Recurring. Look, my brother professes a number of solutions. That is, for instance, in the smartest issue, people who were deemed to what have taken government money should not just be made to what to refund in installments, as you mm -hmm. say, but they should also be punished. I do not think the president or whoever has the responsibility of doing that. The law is there. We should apply the law to the latter. It's as simple as that. It should not be for somebody to make a decision as to whether the person should be prosecuted or not. Because when it happens that way, Nana, if I'm close to you, I'm going to do what happened in the case of what? The smartest issue. Can you imagine if 
it happened to have been an MPP government in power, the lady would have just refunded the money? Probably not. So why don't we apply what? The law. We already have the law as it exists. So if somebody is corrupt, somebody has done something untold, what is expected is that the right individuals who are supposed to serve as a check or as a police in the fight against corruption should do their work. And I don't see any qualms about it. And that is why I make reference to what? The Public Accounts Committee. The Public Accounts Committee, when they sit, we pay them from the taxpayers' mm -hmm. money. We pay them. So why would they waste their time, sit there for the whole day, and sometimes they're even captured on what? On national television. Then we do nothing about it. I mean, it speaks my imagination. I don't understand. So I, I, I believe that, look, and I go back to the point, the argument that I keep making, that the only way that corruption can be purged in this country is when you have committed leadership. When people are committed, people say, look, I'm going to make a mark. At least if by the time I leave office, even if corruption is not erased, mm -hmm. at least there should be some kind of what? Fear put in the people that when you do this, this is what is going to happen to you. And look, we've had leaders who, I mean, you remember when Kofo came into power? The first word is zero tolerance for corruption. Mm -hmm. Even though I was a young boy, I said, wow, zero tolerance for corruption. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine in this country where there's zero tolerance for corruption? That people are going to be judged based on competence? I mean, I need something from you. I do not have to put something at the table. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, today in this country, when somebody does something for somebody, and the person is giving the person money, nana, and you refuse, they say you to me, ah, who is this guy? Where is he from? that you can't take a gift? <laughs> no. So that is why I keep on saying that, look, it's become part and parcel of our system. And I do not think that, look, it cannot be done. I believe it can be done. I think it's supposed to be gradual, but we need to be committed. The commitment needs to be there. I mean, but this, this is something we already know. Yes. So what is stopping us? Well, because we are not committed. We are not committed because of greed. No, no, we are not committed because as a teacher, I sit here, I teach. In some few years, I'll be going on retirement. I don't know what my retirement is going to be. There are no guarantees. You understand what I'm saying? If I go on retirement, I don't know how I'm going to educate my kids. I know very well that the amount of money that I make, and I look, I just oppose that with my lifestyle. I know very well that, look, that money cannot survive what my, 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 my uh, 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 living style. Mm -hmm. But I want to leave that living style. So what happens? I need to look for money. Nana, I'm just an ordinary teacher. My wife is not working. Tomorrow you hear that there's this amount of money in my wife's account. Nobody asks questions. <laughs> you understand? And I, I, you don't get it. You are there. I had ordinary lecturer teaching a Methodist. All of a sudden they see you putting up what? A five bedroom store building. Nobody questions. The remuneration what is very no, good. No, no, I mean, but we know. <laughs> so, so, so that is, that, is where, that is where the situation is. <laughs> that is where the problem is. And interestingly, these people that we live with who are putting up all these mansions, buying all these heavy cars and doing all these kind of things, it's not as if they live in an island. We live with them. We know what they do. And they're how, doing extra yeah. jobs. I mean, and what kind of extra jobs? So I think, I think, look, we should not oversimplify this issue about we, the people, being committed to what to fight against corruption. I strongly believe that, look, leadership, and when I say leadership, I mean political leadership, has a responsibility. They have a responsibility to what? To fight against corruption. There's been this saying that, look, I mean, most times you go to the public service, the civil service, corruption is more ingrained. Yes, it's true. But it's ingrained and fested because those people look up to what? The people on top. Mm -hmm. If you crack the whip, if you lead by example, I do not think that what? The ordinary teacher like Charles will what? Will misbehave. If his head of department comes to work, he takes his work serious. Why won't he do his job? You understand? But all of a sudden, he knows that his work, head of department is doing this, he's doing that. He's doing all kinds of shady things. He will also do the same. And his student will also do the same. So I think it's a, a, a huge fight. But I believe that if we are able to address it and tackle it by the horn, I think it will help us in no, I mean, it's, it will be advantageous to us as a people. And I, it's hard time we try as much as possible to deal with it. Okay, let me take some messages here. Abdul Basit says that, first of all, we must make uh, mandated institutions work, then the attitudes need checking as well. Uh, Kwame Minka says, and Anaba, I think you're wasting your time talking about corruption. The corrupt people are listening, they know what is right, they are not doing it. The government knows what is right, they are not doing it, and we are all wasting our time. Uh, AJ Boafo, uh tweeting from Winneba, he says, Good evening to my lecturer. It's good to see him on TV talking about corruption. We are just corrupt in this country. Even at Winneba, sometimes you have to pay to get admission. It's not true. 
true. <laughs> it's not true. I mean, the admission system is such that you can never. He probably if, paid. No, no, no. He's not true. If, 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 Bro, Nana, Nana, if it's the case, money. if it's somebody no, no, it's, bet, it's not that it came to you. No, if, if it's the, if it's the case, oh, I can do it for you. Uh, when he has look at yeah, the results no, no, and knew if, that if this person will qualify. No, if it's the case if that you use somebody's results, mm. it's possible. But even that, they are going to get you. Really? Yeah. I mean, we, our admission system is. You can't, you, can't, you can't bribe your way through it. Okay. Uh, this gentleman <laughs> calls himself Pope Sin. Right. Pope Sin says that corruption is such a terrible thing eating up our resources in this country. It's been happening since this country was born. It is still happening. I am now 35 years old. I'm sure if I even die at 100, we will still have presenters on TV talking about corruption. A lot so, of people have lost faith. No, they are, I mean, they are cynical there. and legitimately so. Mm. They are cynical because of where because we're Because they are not from. seeing signs. Yeah, they, I mean, they, see, they need to see more. They need to see more than what is happening. Yeah. Oh, we, we, but the problem is that it's not just about those at the top. It's all of us. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That, yeah. is why, that is why I keep saying that it's something that we've bought into. It's something that we've seen as part and parcel of us. It's something that if you do not belong to that, that, that group, you are seen as an outsider, okay. and that is why I cited the example that when somebody comes to you, Nanaba, you do you offer a service for the person, which you are doing your job, mm -hmm. and the person says, "Oh, Nanaba, take and guys, oh no, no, no." The person says, "Who is this woman?" <laughs> yeah, I mean. Okay, what saying Daniel says that um, I think that Ghana has come a long way in the fight against corruption. Mm -hmm. What we need to do really is to prosecute people, punish them, and let the public see that they have been dealt with severely. I don't know what severely uh, means in this context. Um, what is the meaning of corruption? And Anaba, you answered the lecture very well. It is stealing. So these people are all thieves, yet they don't know that they are stealing. Is a question uh, he's asking. Uh, Wasti Papafio uh, wants to know uh, how your universities are fighting corruption. If we know how the universities are fighting corruption, then we can take the government on. Well, do you have? Corruption issues at the Methodist University? I wouldn't think so. Oh, well, I, I wouldn't I think, think so. We have. Have Why don't a bit we? Of it? When you have a student who is going to write a paper and this student carries a foreign material, that is corruption. Okay. For us, if you do that and you are caught, mm. you Does are it doubt. happen very often? People still do. Mm. Even though continuously we send people out of the school. You don't have lecturers asking students for money to pass exams? At times you hear it, okay. but I have told people, uh, fortunately for me, I am the dean of students. Okay. I've oh, okay. asked people that, look, if there is an issue like then that, I'll reduce you come. to head of department. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's and he be quietly be to be <laughs> <laughs> So just come and mm. report. They are not prepared to do that. Because they are afraid. Why? Well, number one, uh, you know, hatred from either your peers or the lecturers. So it appears that we have accepted that certain things should go unpunished. And for me, that is the issue. So let the attitudes... Me, that we, we are ourselves are involved. Let me, let me give, at times I like typical examples. When the late Bao Rido was alive, mm. you know, he was one time the Minister of Education. And for him, he could get up one day and decide that, look, I am going to uh, to visit schools. Unannounced, yeah. Unannounced. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you heard what came out. Mm -hmm. He goes, people, teachers are not there to teach. So he writes something that say you must respond as to why you were not in school. Now, when these things started coming out, Ghanaians, some Ghanaians started saying that, why do you get up and go to a school without informing them? <laughs> you know, and I, I ask myself, I've given you a job to do. Do I need to tell you I am coming to look at but that's the a job culture. I give you? You don't go to anybody's house without permission. That is, you, you that is his house. It's not your house. He is the minister. He is, he, he, so that house. is his house. Yeah. So if I'm coming to my house, do I need to inform you, the tenant? I don't need to. If I come and you are not there, for that matter, I cannot have access to the room. That is a different matter. I go back. But here the school is there. And therefore you are supposed to be there. If you think that you have a difficulty in going, you should inform your head teacher, your headmaster, and then it will be on record mm -hmm. that probably you are nowhere, probably you've, you've gone somewhere, you cannot make it. So if you don't, so what I'm trying to say is that at times we should not be looking, even though I still believe that there should be a political way. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we have given you our powers that look, take decisions on our behalf. 
And we all know that corruption is a big issue. Therefore, what are the political leaders doing? Let them take the lead. Everybody will follow. Mama, I think the, the university environment is quite a different environment. Mm. A different environment because uh, we have two categories of people. We have uh, the student and the lecturer or the tutor. And I happen to be a lecturer and uh, definitely you know I'll be biased when it comes to my position on the issue of corruption. But I think at the end of the day, uh, when we talk of corruption in tertiary institutions, look, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it so probably happen. do not happen. Uh, I do not have the evidence to whether it happens or not, but it needs to be understood within a certain context because our core mandate is to teach. So the question that needs to be asked, is the lecturer teaching? Does the lecturer come to work? I mean, uh, does he even do research? Mm -hmm. Is he well informed? Is he well prepared before he comes to what? He comes to teach. And this is one that uh, can be more or less attested to by what? By the student. Mm -hmm. And you ask the question, what are the mechanisms that have been put in place to address the sign that it could be replicated in what? In our environment. We have something we call a, a quality assurance. Quality assurance where students assess lecturers at the end of the semester. And those assess assessments, the student do not put his name or index number on it. And we have a, 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 an autonomous body that looks at this report. And as a matter of fact, you, the lecturer, you are being promoted based on that what? Those assessments. Beyond that, when it comes to admissions, yes, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, and pretend that, look, mm. people do not use fake certificates and stuff like that. But we've put in mechanisms to try as much as possible well to weed out these uh, 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 individuals who come in. Recently, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Ghana, uh, uh, Professor Aite, mm -hmm. uh, made pronouncement to the father, look, the University of Ghana is going to make sure that everybody who tries to uh, come with fake certificates, the person is going to be, uh, is going to be weeded out. So the point is this, Nana, the point that I'm trying to make here is that you are definitely going to have these problems. In as much as we are human beings, even lecturers, lecturers, some of them will try to manipulate the system. But the onus lies on my vice chancellor, the head of that institution, to mm -hmm. ensure that there's what? There's teacher professionalism, to ensure that people who come into the university come with what? The right certificate, to ensure that people who are awarded certificates mm -hmm. are able to what? To exhibit that, look, I'm a first class student, and I can demonstrate that, look, I'm a first class student. When you have people being given certificates, because they have relationships with what? Lecturers, because they are able to bribe their way through, then it indicts the school. It casts a stare on what? On your institution. And that is where I believe that as a country, we can take something. I'm not trying to say that the universities are the best. Look, mm -hmm. we have a lot of challenges. But if some of these things that, look, now if a student reports a lecturer that the lecturer has given him or her a grade that she does not deserve, mm -hmm. we set a committee and it goes through the processes. You write your head. The head forwards it to the dean. The dean will set a committee. And Anna, if, honestly, the grade that is being given you is not a grade that you are entitled to, definitely something is going to be done about it. And the lecturer is going to be is going to reprimand it. And that is why I'm saying that when it comes to our society or Ghana as a whole, we have bodies like what? A, a public accounts committee, mm -hmm. which is more or less like a committee in the university. They come up with recommendations and findings, and nothing is done about it. That is where we have a problem. So I believe, look, we need to be serious about this fight against corruption. It shouldn't be about talk, but we should walk our talk. Okay. We are taking a break um, shortly, but before then, let's go for Beneficence Countdown right now. And that countdown, of course, you can always catch it on GH Today with Beiswa and uh, Kafui Day and also in the evening on State of Affairs. Hello. What is it? Good day. I'm going to go to Does the number of regions determine how you can win? This is a very interesting topic. In Nigeria, because it's a federal country, the number of states you win helps in determining who will be president. In Ghana, this concept hadn't been there, but in 2008, it 
which was very serious. In the 2004 presidential elections, then President Kufo won a first round. His gap was over 673,000 votes, and he won in six regions. Greater Accra, Western Central, Ashanti, Brong, and Eastern. In 2008, Ronaldo won four regions. Ashanti, Eastern, Brong, and Hafu, and Western. He did not get the 50% plus one votes. He led Professor Mills of the LDC by over 102,000 votes. In spite of the fact that the NDC candidate had won six regions. In the runoff, Professor Mills won eight regions and won with a narrow margin of 40,586 votes, less than 41,000. Now, let me tell you why this concept came about and why some of us were very frightened. Frightened in the sense that people wouldn't understand that a Ronaldo would have become president winning only two regions. And I'll explain to you. Mind you, towards the 2012 elections, the constituencies were increased from 230 to 275. In 2008, Raja constituency had been, now has been split into three. Ablikuma South had been split into two. But in 2008, Raja was one constituency, Ablikuma was one, Ablikuma South was one constituency. Now in 2008, Votes cast in Wager in Ablokuma South in Greater Accra were far more than all the dent constituencies in Upper East, Upper West. I will repeat. In 2008, there were more voters in two constituencies in Greater Accra, that is Wager in Ablokuma South, than all the ten constituencies in Upper West. So if Nanado had 60% of votes cast in two constituencies in Geta Accra, and Professor Mills had two constituencies cast in 60% of 10 constituencies, Nanado would have become president. This map, towards the run-up, this was the map that would have been happening if Ashanti and Eastern Region had stepped up to vote. Ronaldo would have become president of this country, you can see, by winning only two regions, Eastern and Ashanti Regions. Professor Mills would have been candidate with 10 regions and he would not have become president. Are you sure you would have understood it? You wouldn't. But that is how it is. Because East and Ashanti region did not step up to vote. Maybe it was good. Because if they had stepped up to vote for the levels that they voted for President Kufu in 2004, from the map, and now we're present with two regions. So now many people are understanding the number of regions you win or not. That's what determines how well you fare. Okay. So that was Beneficent with a countdown. Dr. Jinapa, I'll come to you first. I think it's, an interesting, it's an interesting uh, analysis being given. And it's one that uh, most people have... Uh, more or less. Uh, Did you understand? He was yeah, wondering I, if we understood. understood. I understood him very well. Mm -hmm. I understood him in terms of representative governance. That's mm -hmm. why he's saying representative governance in the sense that uh, if you win one region and the, you do not win the other regions, but you're still declared as what president, mm -hmm. uh, is it fair to the other regions? It's just major, uh, majority. Mm -hmm. What do they call it? And it happens in most federal states. Go to the United States, you have to win a certain percentage mm -hmm. of what uh, regions. But you see, the point is this. I always have this position when it comes to these issues. 
What does the law say? Now, now, it's as simple as that. The law says that you need to win 50% plus one. Yeah. You know? So if it so happens that most people, as a result of rural urban migration, migrate into what? Accra. And as he said, you take a constituency like Weja and Ablik Masaf. Mm -hmm. The two combined is bigger than the whole of Upper, upper uh, what do they call it? Upper, upper, upper West. West. Then what is the argument being made? I believe that, and I say this from experience. In 2000, when Kufo won, Kufo won by six regions. In 2004, he won by what, six regions. When uh, 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 Professor, uh, Professor Mills came in, he won by more than five regions. You see, when the wind is blowing in your direction, yeah. <laughs> when it's blowing in your direction, you can see it, you can feel it. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there's not been any person who has won election in this country without winning certain swing what regions. You talk of central region, you talk of what brown mm -hmm. you definitely have to win it. So Namado not being able to win the elections and by winning just two what two regions is a reflection of the fact that he did not have the popularity that needed to what, to carry him to become okay. the president. So it's much ado about nothing. All right. Charles, do you have any comments on well, the absence? My only comment is that he was trying to look at the federal state versus our type. Our is just one country. So probably, uh, I don't know exactly why he brought it. Maybe for analytical purposes, because what was done in Nigeria, it would be difficult for that to be done in Ghana, except that we want to change our constitution. If we do not change the constitution, then we have to stay within our limits. Okay, let's take a break now. We'll come back, take a few more of your messages, and then we can wrap up. Do stay with us. You're welcome back. And Sapra Kong says, um, uh, I should ask the two of you to score this current administration in the fight against corruption on the scale of zero to five. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about putting well, zero, you on the zero spot. Being, Can zero you? Being, zero being the lowest, the lowest, five being the highest. Uh, Dr. Jinnah. I'll give, I'll give them two, two. Two? Yeah. That's below average. Well, sure, you're really sure. a lecturer. Yeah, I'll give them two. I'm okay. very, I'm very hard. Very on stingy. To, okay. Yeah, <laughs> How about you, Charles? I, I, I think <laughs> I should I should give them three. Three, yeah. two, three. Yeah. Sure, I'll give them two. I see. Interesting. Them two. Okay. Them Lydia Akpavi says that I'm tweeting from the Volta region, and I'm happy you are talking about corruption because if you come to the Volta region, you people stay in Accra and pay money. We use fish. <laughs> <laughs> <Huh? What? laughs> Where? Don't use fish to bribe. <laughs> I mean, how? <laughs> <laughs> Lydia, come again, please. I, I really am interested in this one. Um, Daniel Omari says, Nana, but the Black Stars won this evening. We are very happy and I'm enjoying your program. But it's sad to say that this country is struggling. We don't have money, yet we are paying these Black Stars so much money. Isn't that corruption? Oh. Uh, how is that corruption? No, it's not. No. no. That is what they deserve. If, if, if they, they are paid and somebody takes... A 10%. Then that's that then there's corruption. corruption. Yeah, but this one, they've worked for it. They, they beat Mozambique. They've put all of us in a very good mood they've tonight. They've done well. They've done well. I mean, did you watch I, the game? No, no, I didn't even know that. I was in school. Oh, you didn't know? You know me, Nana. I don't. <laughs> anyway, you are not a fan of I knew that I was in school. You were teaching. You, you, teaching. So, so yeah. you didn't want to be corrupt by abandoning lectures no. to watch no. the game. <laughs> okay. Then I'll take the final comment from MFA uh, Bohan Sang, who says that, thank you for discussing corruption. I think we'll discuss corruption for a very long time. We only need our president to be serious with the fight against corruption. Anyway, seriousness. The president has shown some seriousness, hasn't he? Well, I think, I think, I think uh, 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 there have been a number of uh, cases that the president, I believe, has handled well, admirably. Mm. Uh, the national service scandal, mm. I think, is commendable. Uh, the issue of, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, this issue of uh, the judges, mm. even though it was a chief justice, but I think the president yeah. played a role. Yeah. Even on the issue of smarties, I, I agree with... Uh, uh, Charles, that uh, something more should have been done about it. But for the minister to resign and the president to accept her resignation, I think it's 
it's it's something a step oh, well. in the in the right direction. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed Jinapo, lecturer from the University of Education, Winneba, and Charles Daniel Kujupoku, uh, lecturer at the Methodist University College here in Accra. Right, so thank you very much for your time this evening. Tomorrow, it is all uh, action from Kweu, so you need to head to Kweu. If you're still in Accra, Kumase, Takradi, Sunyai, wherever you are, you need to be in Kweu. So tomorrow, State of Affairs is taking a break. Uh, and on Monday as well. But have a beautiful Easter celebration. And if you have any uh, Easter eggs, I'll be interested. My name is Nana Banama. Thanks to you, <laughs> Thanks to you uh, for your presence here. Thanks for your messages as well. And we'll see you on Tuesday.